Hello class, this is section 7.4 and in this video we are going to discuss the Helmholtz equation. This is a higher dimensional analog of the eigenvalue problem that we dealt with in the first few chapters of this course. For this video we are just going to restrict ourselves to f having dimension 2 with variables x and y, but in three dimensions everything more or less looks the same. So this is what the Helmholtz equation looks like. So rather than the second derivative, we have the Laplacian of f plus lambda f equals zero, and this is an eigenvalue problem. The boundary condition looks a little bit different. So if you let x, y be on the boundary of the region, so remember this is a 2D or 3D region, then this is what our boundary conditions look like. Remember that the gradient of f is sort of the analog of the derivative in higher dimensions. So we have beta 1 xy f plus beta 2 xy gradient f, dot product of that with the normal vector equal to 0. Now this gradient f dot product of normal, that's just going to be the derivative. So this is the same thing as uh, the boundary conditions we had for the one-dimensional sturm liouville problems earlier in this class. Except, of course, that the beta 1s and the beta 2s don't have to be constant. They can take on values x and y as long as x, y are on the boundary of the region. It is also possible to consider more general multidimensional sturm liouville equations, but uh, th those are really difficult, so um, we're just going to concentrate on this simple Helmholtz equation for now. The Helmholtz equation is typically pretty difficult to solve directly, but we do know some general properties, and let's list them. The first property is that all the eigenvalues, lambda, are going to be real, and again, this is similar to that of all the sturm liouville problems we handled in the past, even in one dimension. Secondly, we know that there are infinitely many eigenvalues, Again, this is a familiar property, the same as in one dimension. And just like in one dimension, we do also have a smallest eigenvalue. And again, there is no largest eigenvalue. The eigenvalues are allowed to go off to infinity. The third property I wrote in red because this is something that is different from the one dimensional case. For a single eigenvalue, it is possible to have multiple eigenfunctions. And the word linearly independent over here simply means that these are actually different eigenfunctions. We're not just obtaining eigenfunctions by multiplying another eigenfunction by a constant. So these are actually, honest to goodness, different functions. The fourth property, and this is another familiar one, is that the eigenfunctions form a complete set. And this means, of course, that there is a Fourier series, and that is, you can take linear combinations of the eigenfunction to approximate any piecewise smooth function, f, x, y. Again, this also works in three dimensions, of course, and the sum over the lambda simply means that we're summing across all the eigenfunctions, or all the eigenvalues, sorry. The next property is also familiar. We have orthogonality of the eigenfunctions. If lambda 1 and lambda 2 are two eigenvalues with eigenfunctions f1 and f2. Then when you take the double integral of f1 times f2 across the entire region, you get 0. So this is what it means to say that the eigenfunctions are orthogonal. But there's also another twist here for higher dimensions that wasn't present in the one-dimensional case. If your eigenfunctions f1x and f2x correspond to the same eigenvalue, but such that f1 is not just a multiple of f2, then orthogonality still works. So we don't actually need the eigenfunctions to correspond to different eigenvalues for orthogonality to work. And finally, we have the Rayleigh quotient, which is a way to calculate the eigenvalue from the eigenfunction using a nasty formula. We're doing curve this involves curved integrals on the boundary of the region, as well as double integrals of the region. So once more, um, we, we hope that boundary conditions 
specify this calculation whenever we have to do it. And sometimes this nasty formula does give us useful information, just like it did in the one-dimensional case.